Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Dr. Pam Schaff, and I'm the director of Keck School of Medicine's HEAL program, Humanities, Ethics, Art, and the Law. And today we are delighted to welcome you to our uh, first virtual art um, event. We've had um, most of our, all of our previous events, as those of you who have attended uh, know, we've had them in either the Hoyt Gallery or in Mayer Auditorium. And today, um, our artist and our physician discussant um, have graciously agreed to do this as a virtual event, and we're glad to be able to share that with you. So um, I just want to say that this exhibit, which will be a virtual exhibit and will be posted on our website, um, continues our program's uh, mission to align the work of patient artists with the core medical school curriculum and to foster enhanced understanding between patients and future health professionals. Um, we are so excited to have with us today Bhavna Mehta, who is an artist who will be discussing her work and her experience, and Dr. Leila Darkey, who is um, an assistant professor in the neuromuscular division here in the Department of Neurology. Also with us is our incomparable artist in residence, Ted Meyer, who will uh, lead our discussion and question and answers, and um, Dr. Erica Wright, who's the associate director of the HEAL program here at USC. So with that, Ted, I will turn it over to you. All right. So let me pull up some slides here. Uh, here we go, just a second. All right. So I just wanted to start with some facts on, uh, because our esteemed artist here, part of her work is, is based on the fact that she has polio. So in uh, 1988, 350,000 cases in the world and last year, only 103 new cases. So it's really pretty under control and uh, which makes the fact that Bhavna is here even more exciting for us because most of you might not get to actually meet somebody who, uh, who has this. Oop. So I'm gonna put up uh, one of her slides here so you can see it. Um, so, Wagner, why don't you tell us a little bit about your medical history, and how you sort of landed up in the States, um, and then we'll take it from there art-wise. Okay. Um, I want to start with thanking Ted for having me uh, be part of this program, and also to USC's HEAL uh, Center uh, for, for just generally, you know, assisting artists and, and accommodating uh, art along with healing. Um, I think that's just really important. And I, I just want to say a big thanks. Um, my polio journey starts when I was seven years old. Uh, I lived in a small rural part of India. I lived in a large family. And I had actually gotten the polio vaccine um, around maybe one year, when I was one year old. I think that's when, that's when the vaccine is uh, given to kids. So I was fine. I was a regular kid jumping around. And then at the age of seven, I was visiting uh, some relatives in a bigger town in, in the town of Mumbai. Uh, which is now a big, big city. But when I was seven, it was not such a big city. But anyway, it was bigger than mine. And I got really sick overnight uh, with a high fever. Um, and within a few hours, I'd lost the use of my legs. Uh, I couldn't get myself out of bed to go to the bathroom, for example. That was the first moment my mother realized that something was happening. Um, my fever continued for maybe two or three days. And the, I think uh, what, from what I remember and what I've been told, I was losing function from the bottom of my body. So the, the feet went first and then the knees and then the trunk, I mean, then the hips. And eventually I lost a function in the muscles around my torso. Um, and uh, anyway, long story short, I was very fortunate to go to a hospital called the Children's Orthopedic Hospital in the city of Mumbai. 
it was the only hospital in the entire country that was dealing with rehab for little kids. Um, I, some, my family somehow got the information that that's the hospital to go to. And I was so fortunate that I was able to go there because they were, uh, they were using physical therapy and uh, really looking at individual cases. Uh, and then I got fitted with braces and crutches uh, within a few months. Uh, and I was able to sort of walk with braces and crutches. That's how I went home. Mm, I did my fourth grade <laughs> uh, in braces and crutches. And that's how I uh, lived my life in India for the next uh, 15 years. Uh, I went to college, I went to university in India, I got a couple of degrees in physics and computer science. <laughs> um, but I had an uncle who lived in the Bay Area in Fremont, and he would occasionally come to India to visit relatives. And whenever I would see him, he would talk to me about how things were changing in the United States. I think there was a big movement in the United States to provide accessibility and to provide civil rights for disabled folks. Uh, the ADA was only a year away when I came to the United States. So I now consider uh, the fact of my immigration with the fact of accessibility uh, in this country. Uh, and I came as a student to do my master's uh, to the to Cal State University, Northridge, so in the San Fernando Valley, not very far from USC. The moment I came, uh, within, not the moment, but within a few days of my coming to California, I took off my braces and crutches and I never put them on again <laughs> because the university was pretty accessible. Uh, my dorm was accessible. I would take my wheelchair from my dorm room to my um, classes. And uh, eventually I, I was, you know, I was able to really do a lot of things on my own, uh, drive a car, um, get a job. And uh, I worked for Nokia mobile phones in San Diego for many, many years before I became an artist. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so that's, that's my story in a nutshell. And I'd be happy to kind of give you any details of, of any, any particular moments. All right, well, it's, now that you've made it from Nokia to being an artist, we're gonna look at some of your artwork. Yes. So let me bring the screen back. Um, so the, the first slides we're gonna show, they were done on your x-rays, which I'm really curious about the fact, so you brought these x-rays back from India, right? These are, these are very old x-rays, which is something an artist would do, especially an artist dealing with disability, like lug x-rays halfway around the world to maybe make art from them a couple years down the road. Yeah. So did you bring them just as an artistic tool or did you bring them in case you met a doctor here who needed them? And I'm gonna pull them up while you're talking about it. Yeah. So um, talk, yeah. talk about how you why you brought them to the States and then talk about uh, each piece a little bit. And I'll, we have four from the series, which is the Through Line series, which was the title series for the show we were going to have at the gallery. Thanks, Ted. I, I can, you can see the date on the x-rays. It's 1984. The, this x-ray was taken uh, just a few months before I had surgery to put two steel rods uh, to straighten out my uh, spinal column. Uh, so I had, I had severe scoliosis. Um, when I came, I think I, I must have brought these x-rays on the very, very first trip from India to the United States, which was in 1989. So five years after this x-ray was taken, um, I think they were in my bag because, you know, who knows when you'll need them. 
Uh, who knows when a doctor might need to see them. And this is kind of the last, um, you know, the last kind of image of, um, of the body before the metal was inserted in the body. So, so this was such a, like a new thing for my family and for me that we really didn't know how the, the rods were gonna do over time. Uh, I've been very fortunate. I've had no issues with the two rods in my, in my bag, but five years uh, after the rods were put in, we didn't really know if they were gonna be a huge problem or not. And I was going to another country halfway around the world. So I think the x-rays kind of went in the bag uh, almost before anything else went in the bag. I found them uh, last year when I had this uh, severe pain in my shoulder and I was starting physical therapy and the therapist asked about my scoliosis. And I really, I remembered I had these x-rays and she uh, looked at them and she realized that I was pushing one shoulder up, you know, just not naturally because I was sitting in this weird position uh, I was, I was, no, my shoulder was not in a good position. That was causing a part of the shoulder pain. So that led me to find these x-rays. And then of course, as an artist, I'm like, I got to do something with it. And, and the show was coming up. You had already invited me to be part of the show. So I thought it was an ideal kind of moment to take this x-ray and turn it into something that tells a story. So let's let's talk about each individual image, and then I'd, I'd sort of also be curious to hear from all the doctors on the panel. You know, Bogdan and I were talking yesterday about how how X-rays are they really have a narrative to them besides medical. That they're, you know, you can look at this X-ray and you know she she had the polio and that then developed a scoliosis and you can tell a lot about. The, there's so much more for us personally. And, and I know as artists now, when I've had things happening, you, you can't get an x-ray anymore because everything is digital. So it's sort of a lost art form at the same time as technology moves on. So I'll let you guys take it from here. <laughs> Well, Bogdan, why don't you tell us about the bead work on these? Sure, first. sure. Um, the, I, I've been really wanting to embroider viruses for a long time. Don't ask me why. Um, I feel kind of bad right now because you feel like a witch. You know, you brought a virus into, into, the, into being. Uh, I didn't, didn't really think about that when I started researching what the polio virus visually looks like and what are the models uh, that have been developed to explain the, the, like the, the body of the virus. You know, I have my body here, but what's the body of the virus looks like? So I, I was looking at uh, just online images and then I also had the opportunity to work with the Salk Institute in uh, San Diego. Um, of course, we all know Jonas Salk created the polio vaccine. And uh, amazingly, I had the opportunity to work with, an, with a lab in the Institute uh, for another art project. And, and so, so all this was kind of in the air for me. And I decided I would just bead, I would use beads to create the image of the virus on the x-ray itself. Um, and it provides color, it provides texture, the x-ray has its own texture, but, but the beads have this wonderful kind of sculptural quality to them. And I really, I, <laughs> I gotta tell you, I really enjoyed beading the polio virus. And I'm, um, you know, I've, I haven't done much with, with the viruses lately, but it's, they're, they're, they're interesting. Uh, they're, they're interesting because we live with them all the time. You know, uh, we live with these small creatures inside and outside our bodies that we can't see. 
Uh, some are really dangerous, but a lot of them are so useful to us. And I am really interested kind of in the science of it as well. So when you were, when you were beating them, I, you know, I've talked to some other patients when they, they do artwork focused on their illness and it's almost like a friendly feeling. They're so familiar knowing yeah. that, like you said, it's, it's in your body. Everyone's got it there. And yeah. so when you're, when you were beating, you're thinking, well, there's my friendly polio virus, or were you thinking like, damn you polio virus? Well, I, I would say neither. I don't think it's a friend. I mean, so many, I was one of the lucky kids, you know, there's so many kids around the world, uh, especially in India and uh, the Middle East and Africa who just don't have a chance with this virus. I, I don't think the virus is the friend. Um, but I, what I'm interested in it is, is looking at things very clearly. You know, I want to clarify things. As an artist, I'm looking to clarify things for myself. Uh, and in doing that, I want to, I want to show it as, as it is. Um, so that's my, that's my dominant feeling when I was doing this. So this, this image obviously has the, the rods in your back afterwards. Yes. yes. So you, you haven't had any redos on this. This is the original one from 1984. I, I, as, as I was telling you, I went to the best hospital in the country, the best orthopedic surgeon known for this particular surgery uh, operated on me. I, I just, you know, I, I just, uh, my family had just a lot of connections. And uh, so I've been okay so far. So this, this question sort of for the doctors with, with polio being basically non-existent in the States, but I presume you're still getting post-polio syndrome people that are showing up in their, their later life. So maybe you could, if any of you have talked to the students about sort of what they would be looking for, someone who had had polio and mm. comes to you at 70 or 80 and they're, they're starting to get symptoms of, of that. I can talk about this because we are getting patients with post-polio syndrome. Mm. So as you mentioned, um, polio has been eradicated, particularly in the United States and all around the world. There are still some countries like Pakistan or I feel Afghanistan, some part of Asia, that they still have cases of new polio. But in our practice, we are seeing mostly patients with post-polio syndrome or some cases of uh, patients with acute flaxseed paralysis due to other viruses that are mimicking polio, like West Nile virus, as well as Coxsackie virus or other enteroviruses. Basically in children, we had, we had some sort of endemic few years ago in California and in the United States. So we do have some acute flaxseed paralysis that also targeting the same region as the polio virus is targeting, which is called motor neuron or anterior horn cell, which she has very beautifully pictured in this image, you can see this is a part of your nervous system that is containing the neuronal cell body and is very important. It's like a generator for your motor neuron to transferring the signals from your brain and spinal cord to your muscles. Right. So a patient, as, as, I, as we said, we usually see the patient with post-polio syndrome. There are uh, commonly patients who had a history of polio any time between seven or like 35 years or more than that, on average 15 years or more, they have been partially or completely uh, recovered with some or maybe non-residual symptoms, but later on they're developing some sort of uh, gradual weakness possibly in the muscles that were not initially affected by the polio at the time of acute illness. Mm -hmm. Other symptoms include fatigue, loss of muscle pain and cramps. And we really 
the etiology behind post polio syndrome is still very not well known. There are potential hypotheses, and one of them is that when you are losing your cell bodies in your motor neuron as the initial attack, the neighbor's motor neuron who has not been attacked, they are come and helping that initial motor neuron. So they are sending uh, like help to the nerves. There's kind of um, supporting the other nerves who do not have a generator. So it's called a spreading nerves. Mm -hmm. So each motor unit, which is that cell bodies and their axons and the muscle fibers that they are covering would get bigger because individual healthy motor unit that has not been attacked now is covering the kids from the neighbor. So the family is now bigger. And this is a kind of compensatory mechanism. And one theory is that at some point, this healthy motor unit is kind of overwhelmed and say that I cannot handle it anymore. And at the time that this post polio symptoms would show up and the muscle would not be as strong as they used to be and they get pain and fatigue with exercises. The other theory is that is the virus kind of stay in your cell body like as latent and it's now showing up again. This is another theory. The other potential theories is that involvement of the immune system is this some sort of pro-inflammatory markers that are involving and causing the post polio. But all would result in reappearance of some sort of weakness, muscle, uh, loss of muscle bulk or muscle atrophy, fatigue, pain, and cramps in individual who were initially recovered or had partial recovery from their polio. Mm. And we don't really know who is more susceptible to develop post polio syndrome but most of the cases are those who had initial severe attack, but also had significant recovery. Mm -hmm. So meaning that this neighbor were actually really helpful at the time. Okay. So they're the patient that we are really seeing in our clinic. Hmm. So are there any, any treatments for these people that come in or do you just rest or re rest the muscles or? So, you know, there have been different type of treatment that has been studied. As of now, there is no uh, disease-modifying treatment or like any kind of cure with post polio syndrome, but it does not mean that we cannot provide any supportive uh, treatment. So they have tried, in terms of tra treatment, they have tried um, medication like intravenous immunoglobulin, in clinical trial or IVIG. People with polio have probably has read about it and they have done clinical trials. Uh, one of the clinical trials showed improvement in muscle strength, but not to the point that was clinically significant. Mm. Some of them showed improvement in fatigue, but there was like very controversial and uh, the, there was the evidence is now not sufficient to say that if it's IVIG would help with polio patient or would not mm -hmm. help. But obviously the other thing that are important is number one, we wanna be sure that this is post polio syndrome. This patient may you know, wander around, go from one doctor to another doctor. They may have lots of um, tests and they might be misdiagnosed with other condition. They might even go under the surgery because they think that it could be some sort of spinal issues like disc degenerative disease or so. So number one is confirming the diagnosis. This, yes, this is you know, post polio syndrome and there is no other thing that might happen as you age like spondylosis, disc degenerative disease or other diseases, neuropathy. Number two is the main focus on treatment is physical therapy and occupational therapy. Mm -hmm. uh, we always send our patient to physical therapists who has experience with patients with neuromuscular disease and particularly with uh, possibly post polio syndrome. Mm -hmm. Exercise plays an important role. We don't want a, a patient to do exercises like more than 
they're expected to fatigue their muscle again because of the pathophysiology of the muscle disease in patients with polio. If you fatigue this uh, muscle, you are actually damaging, the, uh, you know, damaging uh, more. So we would like our patient to have some sort of balance exercises with somebody who is the um, expert in this field. And those exercises are most of the cases low intensity to moderate intensity with low repetition. Uh, there have been different proposal, one of them like start with 20% of your maximum exercise and then gradually go higher. If our patient develop any fatigue, cramp, this means that they're overdoing. So probably they need to take a step back and start it on a lower level. The other important thing is their needs in terms of braces, any assisted devices, safety walking, and uh, also prevent the secondary thing that might cause because of the new muscle weakness, like a joint damage, pain, as well as uh, like osteoporosis, lung disease, because you're not expanding the lung anymore like that sleep issues that might be associated with these cases. I'm sorry. <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> All right, so. Thank you, Dr. Dai. Do, uh, no. for me. I, I, did you want to continue, Bakun? Do you want to? I can answer any question, you know, if there's any other question. So as I said, most of our treatment is conservative treatment focusing on physical therapy, occupational therapy, and rehabilitation, and addressing the comorbid condition like sleep issues and uh, uh, osteoporosis, uh, as well as exercise, and obviously the pain management. So I'm going to go on to the next slide. We were going to show two sets of Bhavna's work. Um, oh, there was one more of these. I guess I forgot to. I guess I have five. So um, let's talk about this, this series. So this one is just body on your website. Yeah. So we, we were talking last night about this series sort of being a way for you to figure out illustrate yourself and figure out what was going on in your body yeah. over the years. Why don't you talk about this and I'll run through the slides. You can actually see the actual piece behind me. Um, tiny, it looks small, uh, your slide's nicer. I believe what I was trying to do with this series is use images to to talk to myself about what still works in, the, in my body. And even though the muscles don't work, my circulatory system is just fine. <laughs> and so I as, I, as I was saying earlier, I'm very interested in science. Uh, I think I have a passion for medicine that um, didn't really translate into a career, but I'm, you know, I'm kind of uh, an obsessive person in terms of what, what things really look like. Um, so I started working on this series and then slowly they turned into stories. Uh, this particular image is uh, about how we speak and how we communicate, um, you know, and how we use language. Um, Sometimes it's all jumbled up, um, but we keep doing it. Um, so another image was of the heart uh, going back to the circulatory system. Uh, uh, the heart in all its glory, I would say, uh, and, and the, the beating of the heart really, uh, really conveying a sense of uh, not just mortality, but also beauty, uh, I think. Uh, and I keep coming back to the image of the heart. Last year, I actually made a huge human, uh, human heart and suspended it in, the in, a, in an art gallery. So 
uh, some things uh, I keep coming back to. Um, using paper and thread is also very interesting because paper is like skin. I think of paper as skin that you can cut. Um, and so uh, having been cut up and stitched up myself, I think it's a nice way to talk about uh, kind of a personal history while using thread and paper to to make images. Um, so, so a lot goes into, uh, you know, making a particular image. Uh, the, the hand here with the, the bones and the uh, cartilage or the tendons is really a way to talk about the fact that my hands have been uh, the reason that I can, um, you know, I've had such an active life. I, I think my hands kind of saved me, um, basically saved my life. <laughs> uh, so I've been using my hands to do everything for a long time, and I wanted to honor them um, by making images of them. So that's kind of so the that, story, uh, Ted, behind all these images. So let, let's talk about, because you have this unique opportunity of having been treated in India and here, do you, do you find a difference in how you were approached as a patient? Is there a difference between American doctors and how they explain things to you and what they tell you? And what observations do you have about that? Uh, fortunately, I haven't had to go to the doctor too much in many, many years. Uh, I actually haven't been treated for polio symptoms or post-polio much uh, in the last, you know, I would say 20, 30 years. Um, I think one of the main differences I find in the United States is a lot of medical professionals don't know what polio is. So I have been asked a number of times, and I'm not talking about my doctor who's just amazing. Uh, she's been great. But, you know, people, if when you, when I go like for a mammogram, for example, <laughs> or when I go to get x-rays because my hip hurts, um, you know, the, radio, the people who are working there, they don't really know what polio is. Um, so I think, you know, maybe that's a good, you know, sometimes that's a good thing that, you, you know, the disease is so far gone that people have forgotten it. Um, but uh, the awareness doesn't exist that people with polio still have sensation so they don't lose sensory neurons. Polio, the polio virus uniquely affects the motor neurons. But in a spinal cord injury, which is very common in the United States, uh, you lose sensation because this, the, the, the cord gets severed for whatever reason. Uh, my husband has a spinal cord injury because of a rock climbing accident. So he doesn't have function and he doesn't have sensation. Um, whereas I have full sensation. Um, so that's a particular thing that I think people are not aware of. They think that I have a spinal cord injury and they treat me like a spinal cord injury um, and forget that you know, there are major differences in, in how the bodies work. Um, so, so I would say those are examples of, of treatment um, in both the, in, in India I had, I think, really, really great uh, medical attention and treatment and I was very happy I had that when I really needed it, like when I was growing and, and I needed to get fitted with braces, you know, all the time because I was growing. Um, I, I was able to, to get to the right places and get the right uh, attention. Um, and I haven't needed that here. So uh, my story with the American medical system is, has been kind of limited. Um, you know, thank goodness. <laughs> I, I, I don't want to get sick. 
Well, let's but, talk about this but, but last want, piece. Of the I'm sorry, I'm question. thanking Dr. Darkey again because I feel that I'm going to get to a point when post-polio symptoms are starting to are going to start to enter my life. And I really appreciate what, just for, what she just said about exercise and physical therapy, because I have become better about it uh, in the last year after my shoulder issue. And, and really, I mean, I've, I think you listen to your own body and you listen to, if rest works, then you rest. You know, if, you know, you do what, what you, you do what you need, you can do and uh, you can research online. But I, I thank Dr. Darkey for, for every, every single thing she said about post-polio especially. Sure, thank you. Um, you want to talk a little bit about this last piece? Oh yeah, sure. Um, I made this piece at an artist residency in upstate New York uh, in 2018 and talking about, um, I'm not sure what to say about this piece. It's, uh, it's about the body because the pelvis appears uh, in the piece. Uh, there's a snake uh, that is a reminder of the spinal cord. I found a dead snake on the road while I was <laughs> taking my afternoon walks uh, or, or, or pushes uh, in, in the country and I found a dead snake on the road. So I actually peeled the snake off the road and took it to the studio. And so I made a lot of images with snakes in it. Uh, the writing uh, that you see on the right side came after the image and uh, again, I think it is a way to convey, I mean, words, words tell a story and uh, I'm interested in all kinds of stories. So I paired the image with the words and, and embroidered everything with thread um, to, to tell, to say something about body and pain and illness. And in fact, this image was, is, in a, is in a show in Carlsbad, California right now. And at the opening, a, a man came to talk to me about the words. And he, he said that he was dragged to the opening by his wife. Um, and he, you know, all art is kind of like, you know, kind of a blur for him. And when he read the words, he had to read them a few times before really understanding what I was talking about. Um, and he related to the words a lot because I think that, I think we all feel pain, uh, whether it's physical pain or mental pain. Uh, or psychic pain. I think he related to the fact that uh, that we don't understand each other's um, pain. Um, and he, in fact, came and told me all this in the middle of the opening. And I was really touched by the fact that something very personal can reach somebody who I'll never meet again. Uh, and I think that's kind of the that's the juicy part of making art for me. You know, that is just so gratifying uh, because the personal is political. The personal can reach somebody uh, in a way that you don't anticipate. So this, this is where we put Dr. Darkey on the spot. So I'm going to uh, stop the sharing so everybody, oh. Am I still there? My computer's sort of freaking out. Can you, Ted, there we yeah, go. Hold on one second. Ted, can I? Okay. Can so, I, um, Ted? So yes, I just, please. I, I just um, actually wanted to ask Bhavna a question um, because we can't be there physically to see this or to um, appreciate it. Um, is, it looks like all of the work is, um, is embroidered um, yeah. with thread or beads. This is not uh, drawing, am I correct? It's, it's with texture? Yes, for the x-rays, it's all embroidered with beads. 
Mm -hmm. uh, for the other series, it's embroidery and cutting on paper. Okay. So the embroidery is done, done directly on paper and then I cut around the embroidery to kind of have a more sculptural kind of feeling to the, to the image. Great, okay, thank you, it's beautiful. I, I wish I could see it and touch it. I, <laughs> I wouldn't too. touch it, but I wish I could. I wish too, I wish you could see it too. Sorry. So I'm gonna go to Dr. Darkey here. So we had, um, you know, part of this whole idea of showing the artwork is for the doctors and the current doctors and our future doctors to see beautiful work created because somebody has an illness as a way to tell their story. And I always like to point out that like all this beautiful work that she's done would not have happened had she been healthy. So I'm just wondering with you as someone who, who works in this field, um, looking at this, do you, do you get a sense of her humanity and, and for the med students to be able to, to look at this work and see the humanity in patients beyond the fact that she's got polio and, and what her work tells about you about her as a person? Sure, I was personally really impressed by looking at her arts is so beautiful. It's making connection at the moment that you are looking at them. Like the way that you are looking at them, you almost forgot that this is initiated from the disease that has been chronic and functionally limiting. And now you're seeing that despite having this functional limitation, how beautiful you can just bring them into other people attention in such a nice and heart touching way. I was very impressed. I can, I searched your website yesterday mm -hmm. and I couldn't believe that, you know, the way that you pictured the motor neuron mm -hmm. was the most beautiful, artistic and very detailed and really touched my heart. I forgot that lots of my patients with motor neuron disease, how much functional limitation that have is with such an opening for like a new vision that how you can take advantage of some limitation that you have had and bring this beautiful art to help yourself and also the other people. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Sure. Thank you very much. <laughs> so Pam, do we have any questions? Does anybody? So we haven't um, asked for questions. So at this point, oh. if any of the people who are watching would like to ask any questions, the Q&A function is, um, is open and you can send in any questions. And while we're waiting for any of those to come in, I wanted to um, just sort of comment and, and ask a question, I think for both um, Dr. Darkey and for Bhavna. Mm -hmm. When I was, um, uh, teaching early clinical students in our introduction to clinical medicine program when I first started at USC, which was, I think, actually, it was either in the 80s or 90s that we would go to um, Rancho Los Amigos, mm -hmm. uh, which is a rehabilitation hospital, and our, uh, we would take our students there so that they could um, meet patients um, who were undergoing uh, rehab services there. Yeah. And that's where I first learned about post-polio syndrome. Yeah. And at that time, I think um, I'm, I'm sad to hear that there's not even more known about it now. But I know at that time, I think one of the um, questions was all of the uh, past treatment, which encouraged people to be extremely active and to do ex extreme rehabilitation may have actually yeah. um, contributed yeah. by recruiting too many of those um, helper kinds of uh, whatever you call them, Dr. Darkey. But I'm just, uh, I'm curious about that. And so I'm wondering how that's affected, how yeah. you've um, interacted with your health professionals, Bhavna and, um, mm -hmm. and Dr. Darkey, just, you know, I, thank you for teaching me about the evolution of that kind of understanding. Mm. Um, I had polio in my right hand uh, when I got sick. And uh, with physical therapy, the, the hand recovered. Mm -hmm. Whereas my legs and my hips uh, did not. They did, the function didn't come back. But the hand recovered. And I think that uh, the, the, the right hand has always been weaker than the left hand. So mm -hmm. when I first started noticing that I was having more fatigue in the right hand, um, 
I did go to my doctor uh, when it became kind of uh, really, uh, you know, uh, affecting my, my computer work. I was a software engineer for Nokia. Mm -hmm. And so I had to be on the computer all day long. And, and at first everybody was saying, well, maybe it's carpal tunnel. Uh, because that's, you know, that's very normal for somebody who's just typing away all day. Uh, but I, I felt that there was something else. So uh, my doctor recommended some exercises, but also recommended that just try not to type so much, <laughs> you know, which wasn't really possible in my job. I had a very demanding job. So that continued for a few years. Um, but it led me to, it was one of the reasons I thought I really needed to have a career where I could make my own schedule and I could pace myself with the kind of work that I do. Mm -hmm. And eventually I quit my engineering job uh, when I turned 40 and became an artist. And as an artist, I have had that luxury of having having space and time to really take care of my, my body and especially my hand mm -hmm. um, while really pursuing something that uh, requires uh, uh, like a real rigor, but not always using the hands so much. Um, so, so that's my story with, you know, going to the doctor and complaining about post-polio. Um, you you must have um, incredible dexterity to do that kind of needlework, though. Well, it's a practice thing, Dr. Shaf. Uh, I think the more you practice, when I first started the beading on the x-rays, the x-ray is pretty thick plastic. Yeah. Yeah. So I have to actually make the hole with another tool and then use the needle to come through the hole. So, so it's a kind of a double process. Um, and, and I was very, very slow in the beginning when I first started. Uh, but the body is such an amazing machine. It, it has such wonderful memory. And uh, my, it, I, I mean, it became much easier as I did more x-rays. Mm -hmm. um, but I did, these, I did the x-rays that you see on the website and then I had to stop because I could feel that I was getting to a point where my hand didn't want to really do it anymore. Mm -hmm. uh, so I will come back to that series, but I, I'm not doing any more right now. Plus I don't want to look at more viruses. <laughs> do we have any questions? If not, yeah. I'm gonna have Bob left. Okay, then Bob, why don't you talk about your, you also started a podcast with your husband where yeah. you talk about I would so love to. Both of you living together. So maybe you could talk about that and tell people where they could find it. I would love, I would love to, to say a little bit about it. Uh, we, George and I have been married for 20 years this year. George has, uh, uh, George is paraplegic because of a mountain climbing accident that he had when he was 23 years old uh, in the state of Washington. And we met we met in Los Angeles, um, maybe not that far from USC, <laughs> um, you know, many, many, many years ago. Um, but we have, you know, we have a particular kind of uh, relationship because two disabilities, uh, we've lived independently uh, for most of our lives. And I thought that the quarantine because of the pandemic was an ideal time to really go deep into certain things that we talk about all the time and maybe want to convey, especially for younger people. Uh, we have several nieces and nephews and we kind of talk to them about a lot of things all the time. So I thought maybe a podcast is a good way to kind of um, clarify again, I come back to the word clarifying uh, our thoughts on, on topics that mean a lot to us. Uh, the podcast is called Hi Shono. I can, I can send you the, uh, I can write it here, but it's available on Spotify and also Apple Podcasts. And also it 
is we are five episodes in, so I feel we have like a good momentum going. Um, and we've got a lot of good feedback from people all over the world, in fact, listening. My family is listening in India, uh, family in London is listening, uh, friends who we know in San Diego and all over the United States are listening. And getting to know us, we are, um, I don't know, it's, it's a very uh, vulnerable thing to do, but we've got just a very encouraging response. So that's the podcast. George is a very good storyteller, as if you, if you listen to even one episode, you'll see. And I feel, uh, I'm, I love like having his voice out there um, in, in, on the internet. <laughs> um, and um, you've listened, Ted, to, I think, at least a couple of the episodes. Uh, Two of them. Say, yeah. Can you say something about it? It's, you know, it's just interesting because you, you've got, you guys have such a unique situation between the two of you. Yeah. You know, between the illnesses, but it's, you know, and I don't know. I just like hearing how you guys sort of look at everything and, and there's not a lot of sugar coating. You just sort of really talk about what's going out there because at this point between a pandemic and what you guys have gone through, you know, why sugar coat anything? Yeah. Yeah. Well, um, I think that we are, we are come, we, we have a lot of differences. George is 77 years old. I'm 53. Uh, we have a huge age difference. We have a big cultural difference. I grew up in a small rural town uh, in India. George grew up in West Virginia. Um, we both, uh, you know, I mean, think about things differently, but it's really been good to come together to, to really, uh, I think, just understand, even understand each other. Like, where are we coming from and why do we feel this way? And, and that, for me personally, has been really great. Um, and I think every episode deals with a particular topic. Uh, we talk about our marriage. We talk about what happened to, to us in terms of how the disabilities happened. And uh, we talk about art. Uh, so these are kind of like big questions for us that uh, are condensed in, in a story format uh, so that it, it can, you know, it can tell you a lot about two people and a relationship and eventually a love story. We um, are just about out of time. So I think Dr. Wright is gonna um, field one question for you and then we'll end there if that's okay. Okay. We just, um, and it might be that the answer is listen to the podcast, um, but one question has to do um, coming from a mental health professional interested in learning from you, how you approach um, the theme of grief and pain in life and in art. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know that we have enough, enough time to answer that, but it does sound like maybe the podcast touches a little bit on that if you want to say yes. a few words. Um, that's a big, big question. Uh, I think disability and isolation go hand in hand. I think the pandemic has brought it an extreme focus what isolation can do to somebody. And I think that it's, uh, I was very fortunate to, to grew up in an extended family system where there was a, a lot of like emotional support. Uh, but, but isolation is a unique phenomena for each individual and making art has been really good for me. But the main thing is you have to reach out. You have to reach out, you have to offer help, you have to take help, <laughs> you have to uh, continuously uh, educate yourself. Uh, I have to, not you, but I have to continuously educate myself about 
things going on in the world where people are suffering, have unimaginable suffering. Um, how, can, how can we understand that? You know, we can't do much about a lot of the suffering in the world, but can we understand it? Um, can, we, can we feel we are part of this entire larger narrative of human existence? Um, how do we do that? Uh, I think that, that can help with grief. Um, and sometimes you just have to like feel bad. <laughs> just feel like, you know, nothing is, nobody's going to understand you. It's all terrible and spend a day um, feeling that way. I think it's totally fine. I think everybody's saying that right now. If you feel bad, if you don't want to talk to anybody for a day, that's totally okay. Um, I, I think the pandemic is, is a really interesting example of how, how people with disabilities live all the time, virus or no virus. Um, you know, maybe that understanding will continue past the pandemic. I don't know. People's, I mean, people's memories are very short, but... Um, I don't know if I answered the question, but I think, I think several things help. Uh, we, find, we find those things for ourselves about what will help us. Uh, but I think mainly it's reaching out. You, you have to talk to people. You have to like just be able to have a connection beyond yourself. Yeah. Well, I think that's a beautiful... Um statement on which to to conclude and I think the the fact that you could bring this to us today and reach out to us today yes. is not, not the way we imagined um, and I hope at some point we can see your work in person but thank you so much for sharing your work and your story Dr. Darkey thank you so much for sharing your um, expertise and sure, helping my pleasure and Ted, of course, and Erica, thank you for, um, for doing this. This is just really um, a, great, a great opportunity in the middle of uh, a difficult time. So thank you very much. And Dan, thanks for your support. I just, I want to say thanks again for you guys reaching out. So um, great to see everybody's faces. Thank you. Thank you. Take care and be well, everyone. Yes. Bye.